Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. We've had a brief moment of technical difficulties, but we're up now. And uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Kelly Caseman, Executive Director of Think Kids. And with me today are Miranda Strickland and Dr. Amy Gannon to hold an informal conversation about obesity and hunger. So let's meet them both. Miranda Strickland is a certified physician assistant who received a Bachelor of Science in Physician Assistant Studies from Seton Hill University. She has over 17 years of pediatric experience and has worked in various offices in Charleston and the surrounding area. She has extensive experience in pediatric obesity, including working with healthy kids, a pediatric weight management, obesity research, and quality improvement program, and most recently participated in a research pilot project in Montgomery using the 5210 toolkit and fruit and vegetable prescriptions. She is currently working as a clinical coordinator for Keys for Healthy Kids, an obesity prevention coalition working to prevent childhood obesity through policy, environment, and system changes. It's associated with Charleston Area Medical Center and Healthy Kids Weight Management Program. So thank you for joining us, Miranda. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Sure. And next is Dr. Amy Gannon. She is a registered dietitian nutritionist, assistant professor, and undergraduate program director in the Department of Dietetics at Marshall University. She formerly served as an extension specialist and director of the SNAP-Ed Family Nutrition Program at WVU Extension Service. Throughout her career, she has worked extensively with pediatric weight management, both as a clinician and as a community-based dietitian. Amy's primary teaching and research interests include nutrition education, food science and food preparation, childhood obesity, and nutrition across the lifespan. As a faculty member in dietetics, Amy is very involved in the collaboration and outreach of Marshall Dietetics and Huntington's Kitchen, both members of the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative. This year, she has precepted graduate level dietetics students to deliver culinary medicine and social media cooking and nutrition demonstrations virtually to healthcare practitioners and community members through Huntington's Kitchen. Thanks for joining us, Amy. Thanks for having me. Sure, and thanks to both of you. So let's begin um, by discussing a recent report from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation titled The State of Childhood Obesity, Prioritizing Children's Health During the Pandemic. Let me just pull up that cover here. And let me share a quote from it. So childhood obesity has been an ongoing epidemic in this country for a generation. The national childhood obesity rate has been rising for decades, putting millions of children at greater risk for type two diabetes, high blood pressure, asthma, and other serious conditions. The newest available data show that 15.5% of youth ages 10 to 17 have obesity and reaffirm persistent racial and ethnic disparities with rates remaining significantly higher among black, Hispanic, American Indian, and Pacific Islander youth than among white or Asian youth. Here in West Virginia, our rates remain well above the national average. So my question to both of you as we begin is these numbers beg the question, why? Why are West Virginia childhood obesity rates much higher than the national average? And what are we doing differently? So I'll start that, Kelly. Thank you for having us. And so in order to discuss why the rates are higher, we have to talk about something called the culture of obesity. And this, the definition of this is it's a systemic unhealthy factors that exist across all systems that contribute and encourage the development and increase of obesity. So these factors are things like access to healthy food, exposure to unhealthy food, lack of education and resources around health and nutrition, access to safe spaces to play, genetic differences, access to healthcare, and unhealthy targeted marketing. So we've actually, an example of targeted marketing is we figured out that marketing companies actually target teens to have them choose unhealthy options and then encourage that through that, they market them specifically. So in West Virginia, according to the 2018 West Virginia Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, West Virginia ranked the first highest in the nation for the prevalence of poor physical health poor mental health and physical activity limitations due to poor physical or mental health. So one of the big things in West Virginia that increases our rates of obesity is poverty. So we're in the top five states in West Virginia, I'm sorry, in the US 
with the percentage of households unable to provide adequate food for one or more household members due to lack of resources. So our food insecurity rate is 15.7%. So the higher the poverty rate or food insecurity, the higher the rate of obesity. Another factor is the lack of healthcare coverage or healthcare access. So West Virginia has a very high rate of uninsured people. It also has a high rate of people not having access to quality health care. So another thing is high rates of physical inactivity. So a lot of people in West Virginia are inactive. Um, another one, lack of nutrition, education, resources, access to healthful foods or affordability. So even if people can do have access to fruits or vegetables or healthier foods, they can't afford them. So those are all things that contribute to this. And with that culture of obesity, so we used to blame the parent or the child or the adult for their obesity, but we've actually found there are so many factors that contribute to it. The environment, genetics, all of these things that I'm discussing that it's so multifactorial that it's not just one thing that contributes to those increased rates. Amy, do you have anything to add? Sure. Um, I think you touched on a lot of very important points and you talked about how poverty and obesity are so inherently linked. <clears throat> Excuse me, I like to think of this in terms of we are oftentimes familiar with the term generational poverty. And I feel like in West Virginia and in many places in Appalachia too, we've become generational obese. So our lack of ability to know how to choose and prepare healthy foods is being passed on from generation to generation. Um, one thing that's important to recognize is that we have um, not only socioeconomic but environmental anomalies that are that help us to stand out from many other places in the country. We have many places where, where food deserts exist, and I know we're going to get to that, where people um, really have lack of access to affordable, safe, healthy foods all of the time. And when that is available, we have lack of knowledge of how to prepare those foods. You know, the traditional Appalachian diet has very health, has many healthy foods naturally in it. You know, we have traditionally been gardeners, we choose legumes, we have uh, oftentimes wild game, but in many areas in our state, we've gotten away from those traditional habits and have really adapted to a Western diet high in starch, high in fat, high in sugar, all contributed to all of the reasons that you talked about, Miranda. Great, hey, thank you both. So I'm gonna outline some policy recommendations from the uh, report I just referenced. Um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation recommends these. Uh, raise the suppl Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program benefit level, so that's SNAP, so raise the SNAP level. Ensure waivers remain in place to ensure WIC offices have the flexibility and support they need to serve families, which we know that those flexible waivers came um, at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Ensure that the USDA continues to serve free school meals and snacks through fiscal year 2021. Um, ensure that the second CARES Act package, which hasn't been introduced yet, but we, we are hopeful that a second one is coming, um, will provide more funding for Head Start programs, um, that the USDA and HHS will look, will work with the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee to ensure that there are guidelines um, in place that will help reduce consumption of added sugars, that the federal government should provide guidance and funding to ensure that schools can continue to help students be active during the pandemic, since we know that they're not in school and being uh, have the ability to participate in physical activity, PE, and, and other recess and other uh, activities that may be going on during school but aren't now. So what are your thoughts on these policy recommendations? And are there any one or a few uh, policies that you would prioritize? So that's a really difficult question. Um, it's difficult to prioritize them because I think they're all so important. But if I had to choose, I think one that I would especially choose is the SNAP benefits because SNAP is so important. It benefits the economy, 
It improves food security or insecurity, I'm sorry. It even benefits children's health and academic performance. So that's really something that is very important and reaches all aspects. The second one is school meals and snacks. So that's really important. We found that healthier school meals are linked with a lower risk for obesity. So it's really important that our children are fed and they found that in going to school, that's where children really receive most of their meals, or I'm sorry, the, the children that are low income get a lot of their meals from the schools. So there was a new report that came out that they had done research about the school's nutrition, school meal nutrition standards that were rolled out during the 2012 to 2013 school year. And they found that by 2018, the prevalence of obesity among children and families with low incomes was 47% lower than would have been expected had the healthier nutrition standards not been put into place. So the authors estimated from that, that that translated to more than 500,000 fewer cases of obesity, which that is a significant number. So having those healthier school meals really can make a huge difference on our rates of obesity. The other one that I would prioritize is WIC. So we talk a lot about the first thousand days being really important with our kids, focusing on their nutrition in the beginning, and that sets the stage for their whole life. So it's really important that we have WIC participation. Um, in uh, West Virginia, they actually looked at our rates and found in September 2019, there was an article that said that we have a 50%, 50%, only 50% of our WIC eligible people are using WIC. So we really need to increase our enrollment with that. But that's a big thing is WIC participation and it increases fruit and vegetable consumption. I didn't know that, thank you. That's really astounding. If you think about all of the families that are left out that could be taking advantage of those benefits. I agree with Miranda that it would be hard to prioritize because I think all of the RWJF recommendations in the state of obesity report are all um, very pertinent. They're all really important. I, I probably feel very passionately or most passionately about two things, and that would be SNAP. Um, I think it's always good if you can promote healthy foods. So if you could use a program like SNAP Stretch or have other incentives to encourage SNAP participation to buy healthy foods, whole grains, lean proteins, fresh fruits and vegetables, especially that would de-incentivize buying um, more calorie rich added sugary foods like sugar sweetened drinks. So that's one thing that I think is very important. I think if we look at school meals, Miranda really hit the nail on the head about how important school meals are in the lives of children, especially in West Virginia where we have high rates of poverty. You know, we live in the richest state, or in the richest, not state, in the richest nation in the entire world. And personally and professionally, I feel every child deserves to be fed for free at school. And it would be nice if the USDA would have funding to make that available for all children, regardless of income. I know that in West Virginia, we have made funding available for all children to have free and reduced meals through the end of this semester. Um, the RWJF report recommended that be done through fiscal year of 2021. It would be nice if that would be extended even longer because many children do require those school meals to get in all of the nutrients they need. We know that kids who consume school meals have higher nutrient intakes of very important key nutrients needed for growth and development. Also, um, eight, we know that about 18% of the total cost goes of raising a child goes to food. And many families who are strapped with, you know, having lost their jobs due to COVID and many other financial obligations due to the pandemic, having free meals all year long would be very important. And really, it should be part of our school, school-based programs all of the time. School meals are part of the hidden curriculum. There should never be a time when a child goes hungry when we have plenty school, plenty meals available in school. Miranda also talked on the dietary regulations of school meals. Um, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act was passed in 2010 and it put very stringent guidelines on nutrients to recommend and nutrients to cut as part of the school meal package. Some of those guidelines have been rolled back and have been lessened since 2018. And every year the guidelines get a little loose and a little more loose. We're talking about nutrients like sodium and saturated fat and whole grains. 
So it, it, when we, if we would tighten those regulations up a bit, we would see less health disparities among low income children and we would see greater nutrient intake. So the dietary guidelines for Americans are published every five years. They're based on the latest and greatest nutrition science that's available. I really feel like um, school breakfast and school lunch guidelines and recommendations should really fall right in step with the dietary guidelines. That's great, great points from both of you. Um, and before we pivot away from this, report, are there any West Virginia specific challenges that aren't addressed by these recommendations? So Amy kind of highlighted on one thing, but I think really we need to prioritize SNAP stretch. So SNAP stretch actually allows eligible, SNAP eligible participants to purchase more fruits and vegetables. So it doubles the amount of what they're producing. So if they use a dollar, then they get $2. And then if they have the child with them, they get three. So it's really a very good program. We had rolled it out. Um, they rolled it out last year and it didn't do as well. But this year, because of the pandemic, when we started it, we ran out of SNAP stretch funds very quickly. So it's something that really needs to be prioritized because so that people do have more access to fruits and vegetables. Something else that I think is really important is making food available to all children under the age of 18, not just school, children that are in school, um, with the pandemic, a lot of families are homeschooling their children, so those children would not have access to the school meals because they're not in the school or doing the e-learning or virtual learning. So I think that would be a good thing to do, make the school meals healthier. Amy talked about that. That's exactly what I was going to say, too. And then I talked about increasing the enrollment of WIC. I think that's really important. Complete street policies where we have full sidewalks, we have, we have access to ride bikes and just those are all things that are really important to increase our physical activity opportunities because we know that's a problem in West Virginia that we are not as physically active as we should be. Right, I agree. <laughs> Me too. And certainly, you know, due to the pandemic, we have been less active than we were before. So it's, you know, compounding the problem. So let me stop sharing this and we're going to um, move on um, to discuss food deserts, food swamps, and how food insecurity connects with our health. Uh, with our health, and then we'll move on through all of this through the lens of COVID. So let's start with the very basics. What is a food desert? What's a food swamp? And what's the difference between a food desert and a food swamp? So a food swamp is an area where there's an abundance of fast food, what we would think of as like junk food outlets, convenience stores, and where those types of um, places to buy food outnumber healthy type of retailers where you would find um, typical grocery stores. A food desert is really has a very specific definition. It's usually a mile from a supermarket or grocery store in an urban area or 10 miles in a rural area. And so in West Virginia, of course, we have both of those. I always pose these, um, these ideas to my students at Marshall and I say, look out the window, what would you consider this area to be a food swamp or a food desert? Now, if we drove to a more rural area, for example, Grant County, West Virginia, where at my last count, there was one grocery store in the entire county. So that would certainly be considered a food desert. And then was there a second part of that um, question that I was supposed to answer? I think you touched on both. What's the difference between a food desert and a food swamp? So I think you covered it. Um, so I'll pivot to the next question. You both work in highly pop populated areas in our state. Do you still see patients or have partners who live or work in food deserts or food swamps? So Keith has been working with different providers from different locations. And one of the locations actually is a food desert. So we had started with all of our providers um, having them screen for food insecurity. And at that place that was a food desert, they had enrolled 26 patients in our program and nine out of those 26 patients had food insecurity, which is a percentage of 35%. So that is a huge number. And that, that problem of food insecurity has even been magnified because of COVID. But that's something that definitely, I mean, you can't, it says you can't tell by looking. So you really can't tell by looking if a child is food insecure, but it is something that is really, really important that we're addressing. I have definitely seen um, pediatric patients and adult patients who live in both food deserts and in food swamps. I can tell you that there are unique challenges to both of those. I agree with what Marinda said. Um, 
at Marshall, we have a nutrition education grant that is funded by SNAP Ed, and we have a unique program that we are, um, it's a unique initiative where the, we are still working on it. It's in the development phases, but it's really to improve access to healthier foods in rural areas. So our program addresses five counties that kind of go around West, around Marshall University. So Cabell County, Kanawha County, Putnam County, Mason County, and Lincoln County. So of course, in those areas, there will be a lot of food deserts and places that are really um, rural and that it's hard to get to the grocery store. So this is a smarter market program where we would be doing like demos with a meal a week. We would look at what, for example, would be carried not really in a large chain grocery store, but maybe a mom and pop grocery store or even something like a Dollar General. So if this is approved by, you know, our SNAP Ed funders, we're really excited to work with and teach people how to choose healthy foods from what's available to work with retailers to bring in more healthy foods, frozen vegetables and more fresh options. And then teach people how to create meals based on you know, what's available there in their local store. So we'll work with both consumers and the retail sector to make healthier food options available, but then also how to prepare those healthy foods and build meals for those. That's exciting. I'm excited to hear how that progresses. Uh, so let's move on um, to discuss the Hunger in America 2014 study, which found that many households served by the Feeding America network of food banks include people coping with a diet related chronic disease. 58% of households reported having at least one member with high blood pressure and 33% had at least one member with diabetes. The cycle of food insecurity and chronic disease begins when an individual or family cannot afford enough nutritious food. And so there are direct correlations between eating less nutritious food and obesity. <coughs> Excuse me. How do high calorie and overprocessed foods adversely affect our health? First of all, <coughs> Let's talk about which high calorie and overprocessed foods and nutrients we're mostly referring to. So we're thinking about more energy rich, rich rather than nutrient rich foods, foods that are high in sodium and salt, foods that are high in added and sugar, snack cakes, sugar sweetened drinks, foods that are high in saturated and trans fats. And there's definitely a direct correlation between those types of nutrients and diseases like cardiovascular disease, which is the number one cause of death, diabetes, um, kidney disease. Many people have direct sodium sensitive hypertension, especially African Americans, people who are already overweight, people who have existing hypertension are much more likely to be salt sensitive. So, you know, that is having excess sodium, which is always present in processed foods is always a negative thing for both heart health and blood pressure. Over time, added sugars that we find, especially in sweetened beverages, which is the number one Call, or number one intake of added sugars in the American diet um, lead to weight gain, which ultimately leads to insulin resistance and over time type two diabetes. And we know that in West Virginia and Appalachian both, we have a disproportionate number of people who have type two diabetes. And then you have to also look at the overall nutrient profile of a highly processed refined diet. When we talk about refining, we really are removing the goodness of the whole grain. So we take off the fiber, we take out all of, a lot of the nutrients and not everything is added back in during processing. So if you're eating mostly refined white, um, the typical white kind of Appalachian foods, refined pasta, refined breads, you're not getting fiber, you're not getting antioxidants, you're not getting um, zinc, you're not getting as many minerals, you're not getting omega-3 fatty acids, and all of those nutrients are very protective to our bodies. Chronic systemic inflammation is really an underlying key factor in all of the disease states that I've mentioned. So cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, stroke, even autoimmune disease. And this chronic inflammation is positively correlated with aging, comorbid disease, and then also refined foods. So those refined foods tend to have an inflammatory effect on the body. Um, they're more likely to cause or, or be directly correlated with metabolic syndrome and various chronic diseases. So if you think about those refined foods as the westernized diet, what we more typically consume in America and then in, also in Appalachia as compared to a Mediterranean diet, which many people are familiar with. So if you think of the Mediterranean diet as having healthy fats and oils like olive oil, um, high intakes of seafood, which provide omega-3 fatty acids and prolifera of 
uh, lots of different fruits and vegetables. So dark green vegetables, dark orange vegetables, lots of citrus, lots of tomatoes. Those provide antioxidants, um, healthy lean protein, and then rich in vitamins and minerals that our body needs to not only fight inflammation, but help to combat those chronic comorbid diseases. Great, thank you. Miranda, do you have anything to chime in before I ask the next question? No, okay. we covered it all. <laughs> That's her specialty. <laughs> that was fabulous, Amy, thank you. So next, um, uh, what is the stigma behind food insecurity? So why would someone choose not to tell their doctor or to use a food pantry? So I think some people are embarrassed to admit that they don't have enough food. Um, that's been a big thing is, you know, so they don't want to come out and say that. But also, I think that something that we have really realized with COVID is that providers don't even realize that their patients are insecure. So few providers aren't screening for food insecurity. So it's not that sometimes the patients wouldn't admit that they were, it's just that the question is not being asked. So that's something that I really, we really discovered with working with the practices is that a lot of times they didn't even realize that their patients were food insecure. So we definitely have to be asking that question um, to really identify and to target those patients. And COVID has made it really easy. Um, I was actually talking with um, Dr. Jeffrey, who's the director of Keys for Healthy Kids. And she was saying that it's actually been easier to talk to patients about food insecurity because she can use COVID as an excuse. So we all know that COVID has increased our rates of food insecurity. So it's something that we can make a blanket statement to patients so that they're more willing to open up so that it, you know, it's something that we're seeing across the nation. So I think that's allowed people to have less stigma about coming out and saying that they're food insecure. Mm -hmm. So two points, one, that, one thing that I found, found was very interesting one of the dietetic interns that I'm working with now, Sydney, was the former director of the Marshall University Food Pantry. So we have a, we've established in our college a food pantry for Marshall students, but it's also open to people of the greater Huntington community. And Sydney worked there as the student food director. And she gave me a quote. She said, I found that many people did not even realize they were food insecure when they would come to the pantry. They felt that someone else might need the food more than they did. And so it seems like maybe it's become a way of life for some people that, you know, running out of food before the end of the month or not having an, an adequate supply of food every month has become the norm. I think it's important really to consider hunger beyond the standpoint of just physical hunger. You have to look at the overarching effect that poverty and inequality have. Food security can be an issue that can affect anyone. And we've seen that now during COVID more than anything. You know, you've seen on the news, lines and lines that stretch for miles, people who are lined up for their local food pantries and, and even you know, food bank donations, trying to meet the need of everybody. Food insecurity really has to do with shame. And you know, it's one thing to say you're struggling to pay, to pay your rent on a monthly basis, but it's another to say, if you can't afford to feed yourself or your family, what are you spending your money on? And, and that, there's where that stigma is attached. So you know, when households fall below the federal poverty line, and we, it's much harder to afford food on a monthly basis. We know that a large portion of the American income has to go toward food, especially to, re, to feed a family. And so we really have to um, look at the gap that income equality has created over the past decades and take that into consideration in balance, you know, as we balance out the stigma that food insecurity causes. Thank you both for those rather deep answers. It's a lot to think about. Um, before we move on to some of the themes we learned at our recent Health and Hunger Summit series, I want to take a moment to ask our intern, Maddie Lavoie, who has been sitting in the back and keeping an eye on our Facebook page, if there are any questions or comments um, coming in for our panelists. Um, no questions have been asked thus far, Kelly. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Maddie, and for taking an hour to uh, join us. And if any of you are watching and you have any questions, please feel free to write them um, below uh, in the comments and we will get to them before we sign off this evening. So let's move on. 
As you both know, we recently held the Health and Hunger Summit series, and I really learned a lot um, from the healthcare professionals and the food resource providers about how the pandemic is increasing hunger and restricting travel, tightening budgets, and making some foods less available. So personally, how is it affecting your work? So Keys does a lot of grant work with um, providers, medical providers and child care centers. So we always every summer do child care markets and medical markets. Well, we actually this summer we started with the medical markets of um, providing fruits and vegetables to the child care centers and um, at medical provider locations. So this year, because of COVID, normally we would start early in May or June, and we actually weren't able to do that until August. So we had to delay those markets, and we also weren't able to offer as many open farmers markets as we wanted to because of COVID. Um, a lot of providers were nervous about having an open market. So instead, we did produce boxes where we would give them boxes of produce. And with that, it, it isn't as good of an experience as being able to shop at the market because they don't get to touch the food and choose which one they want to try. It's just to get the box. So that definitely um, hindered our work. We figured out a way around it, but um, we were resilient through it. Um, and then also we had projects, we had a program that we were doing, a family-based weight management program that I had actually started two weeks before the shutdown. So we only were able to do two live classes and then we had the shutdown. So we actually had to cancel the classes, but now are doing it virtually. So we had to change the way we were doing our program because of COVID. I would just reiterate what Miranda said. I mean, we've just had to be flexible and pivot. You know, everything that we've tried to, that we would normally do in person in terms of nutrition education and food education, we've, we've turned to doing virtually. It's been certainly more difficult with our grant program at Marshall. You know, we educate thousands of low-income children about nutrition education every year. And we go into schools and we work not only on direct education, but policy system and environmental changes. We've had to make that virtual, but it's also helped us to think outside the box, which is how we started thinking about the retail sector. Um, and then we've also had to do some consumer education. You know, in the spring, there was some panic about food shortages. You know, we all remember the toilet paper shortage, of course. And then there was panic, panic about different food sh shortages. But really, there was oftentimes just shortages in the processing and not actual food. So we've had to do some education in, in things that we always tell patients, shop local when you can, shop at, shop at your local farmer's market, buy your meat local if you can, versus in the grocery store, because there's not an actual shortage of food. It was a shortage of processing. So all of those have contributed to differences in my work. Well, great. Thank you both for that. And here's... Um a question that is really kind of complicated. I'm glad you're both joining us to answer it. What's the connection between obesity and COVID-19? Can being obese or eating a poor diet affect your body's response to contracting the coronavirus? So that is a very complicated question, Kelly, but they have definitely found that there is a correlation and obesity is a big risk factor for COVID-19. So they did a meta-analysis of 399,000 patients, and this was published on August 26th in Obesity Reviews. But they found that people with obesity who contracted SARS-CoV-2 were 113% more likely than people of healthy weight to land in the hospital, 74% were more likely to be admitted to an ICU, and 48% were more likely to die. So those are actually very um, sobering numbers. Um, the CDC site said that it does increase your risk of severe illness, even people with overweight. It may triple your risk of hospitalization. They said as your BMI increases, the risk of death increases. Studies have demonstrated that obesity may be linked to lower vaccine responses for numerous diseases. So in looking at that, now they're trying to figure out, so why is that? What is it about obesity and COVID-19 that this is a risk factor and that people do get sicker? So some of those things that contribute to obese patients having worse outcomes is impaired immune function. So um, I'm trying not to be too deep here, but the fat cells infiltrate the organs where immune cells are produced and stored. 
So those immune cells aren't able to get in and fight off the infection as well because the fat cells are there in those organs. It also decreases lung volume and capacity because the abdomen is pushing up on the diaphragm. So they can't breathe as well. So that's a problem whenever you, when you have a virus that affects your lungs. Chronic inflammation, Amy actually mentioned about that obesity causes inflammation. And that's something that COVID-19 also does. It, it's an inflammatory virus. So it magnifies that. Um, people with obesity are more prone to blood clots so they can get blood clots in their lungs. That causes an issue. They also said that obesity can be stigmatized because it is, I should say, because it's stigmatized, people with obesity may avoid medical care. So they may not go to the doctor as soon. And then they're sicker by the time they do go to the doctor. So people with obesity are more likely than no normal weight people also to have independent risk factors that also are already risk factors for severe COVID-19, like heart disease, lung disease, and diabetes. Amy also touched on metabolic syndrome which affects blood sugar levels and um, has people with high blood pressure. So it kind of is a syndrome that, that affects people in different, in different components. And they found that that has an increased risk of ICU admission, ventilation, and death. So because of this, I think it's really made us become more aware of the need to be healthier, to lower our rates of obesity. So I want to turn and, and make it this positive, <laughs> all the, the negative information I'm giving, I want to turn it around. And so with this, it can encourage us to do something about it. So there are things that we can do. We can be more active. Physical activity is something that has been shown to decrease the severity of illness of COVID. So it's really important. We need to be more active. Um, again, what Amy's talking about, increase our nutrition, eat more nutrition, nutritious foods, eat more fruits and vegetables. Something that, that COVID also has had an adverse effect on is our children. So they predicted with the school closings that if schools remain closed through 2020, this is a study that was done, it predicted that there could be 1.2 million new cases of childhood obesity, obesity nationwide. So that is an astronomical amount. So really, I mean, it is, COVID has had so many uh, adverse effects on obesity. So it's something that, that we really, I think it actually brings it to light so that we really can focus on it more and make our communities and our state healthier. Right. right. Well, it makes common sense, right? I mean, these kids aren't getting outside. Yes. And, and they're, they're not interacting like they used to. And then you think of the fact that the virus spread is getting worse and it's getting colder outside. So it's just gonna compound the problems that we're already having. Amy, do you have anything to add before we, we move on? No, really, I think Melinda covered it very well. Okay. One other thing too, Kelly, I was gonna say, I think too with COVID is people are really overwhelmed right now with everything. So I think that's another, when we're talking about the culture of obesity, we have to think about how hard it is for, for families right now with doing virtual or e-learning, um, working, you know, just, being sick from COVID, like it just there, it's multifactorial. So we have to give ourselves grace, but also realize like, it's something that we do need to, we do need to make an impact on and do better on being healthier. Agree. Well, I think if we take deep breaths, maybe some yoga, meditation will help with that stress. Take itself. some walks, definitely get outside. I know that during this time, you know, we can still go to the park and luckily we've had really good weather. My family and I have enjoyed a lot, actually, we've been outside a lot. We've done some state parks. We've done a lot of nature trails, even our local city park. You know, we've tried to socially distance away from other people outside, of course, but it, being in nature has really helped. And busy, being physically active reduces that stress, which also leads to chronic inflammation over time. Pack a healthy snack and a bottle of water. <laughs> yes. And the weather has been great. Not, not yes. today so much, but the weather has been really um, agreeable. Right. And we are lucky in West Virginia that we do have a lot of natural beauty. And our state park system is amazing. There are so many trails. I felt like this summer we started doing a lot of trails and, and visiting a lot of state parks. And I thought, I've never lived anywhere else. How, how did I not know about this my whole life? And here we have these things at our fingertips and they're amazing. 
agree. Well, thank you both. And we're, we're going to head on home now. So uh, meaning how can we use all this information that we've just discussed uh, and apply it to our personal lives? So if I live in a food desert or a swamp and I'm living on a tight budget right now, how can I still eat a nutritious diet? Is it possible? Well, I am going to say, of course, it's possible. Um, I feel like that most people end up re relying on quick convenience foods or fast food when life gets really hectic, when they don't have time to cook or they don't have the knowledge or know-how how on how to prepare healthy foods. So really, you know, cooking is not, an, not everyone has the innate knowledge to cook. So I, I think of it as like any other skill that you have to learn. And certainly there are lots and lots of resources available. We're online now more than any time ever in the past. So one thing is take some time and, and learn some basic cooking techniques. But in terms of eating a healthy diet on a budget, for sure, I love the concept called cupboard cooking. And it's really a matter of analyzing what you have on hand um, and being creative what you can put together for a meal. So you know, it would be simple and easy to grab a processed box of tuna helper, for example, off of the grocery store shelf. You might pay, I don't know, $3 and something for that box. But you could also put together some um, foods that you already have in your pantry to almost create the same thing. You have a can of cream soup, you have egg noodles, you have a um, can of lean tuna, and you have frozen broccoli. You can make that same meal healthier with less processing, based on what you have at home. And it's gonna to stretch to feed maybe two meals rather than just one small thing that you're gonna get out of that box. <clears throat> I also like to say to stock up on frozen vegetables. It really helps with this concept. Of course, fresh is wonderful, but you know, it, unless you're buying in season, fresh can be very expensive. Frozen vegetables are cheaper than fresh most of the time, and they're really picked at peak ripeness. And when they're frozen, it sort of stops the nutrient degradation. So nutrient content is really high in frozen vegetables. They're very easy to cook. You have lots of different ways. You can steam them, you can saute them, you can throw them into sauces and stews. So they're very healthy and they're very versatile. Um, a couple other things. I, I like the concept of cook once, eat twice. So cook enough portion of what you're making to stretch it for more than one meal or cook a large enough portion of protein that you then can combine it with different whole grains or different frozen vegetables to get two meals out of it. That tends to be a lot more cost-effective. Um, fresh fruit is best, but choosing a variety of canned and dried, as long as there's not a lot of added sugar, can save some money. I love cooking with eggs, even for dinner. I, I like to always say that breakfast for dinner is an Appalachian way, but um, eggs don't have to be prepared in actual breakfast for dinner. Eggs are a very versatile protein. They're a complete protein and they're very inexpensive. For dinner tonight, we're actually having a frittata. So we're using um, eggs that we bought at the grocery store, of course, but we're using some fall vegetables that are growing in my garden to make a frittata out of that. It's one of the cheapest, healthiest sources of protein that you can get. Replacing meat with beans can increase your fiber intake, but also lots of other nutrients too. Beans are a great source of many, many nutrients and save a lot of money. So beans have high fiber, high protein, but much more cost effective than for example, meat. Keeping canned meats like canned salmon, canned tuna, canned chicken, they can be rinsed to get rid of some of the sodium, but you can make healthy options like healthy chicken salad, healthy salmon cakes. Um, you can put tuna into a sandwich or, or part of a casserole. Um, and then you can use frozen fish, frozen chicken. Lots of times I stock up on big bags of frozen chicken breast at the grocery store, which is much less expensive and can be stretched a lot further on a budget than if you buy fresh cuts of chicken breast, which tend to be very expensive. You're making me hungry. <laughs> I, always, I always do these things in the evening and then I'm, I walk away so hungry. <laughs> So along with the lack of, of availability and expensive healthy foods um, that um, all of us, besides that, not all of us like to cook and we don't always have the time to do it. So do you have any further suggestions other than the ones that you just offered? Sure. So um, take some time to learn about cooking. You know, 
it's like America has a fascination with cooking now and, and all of the cooking shows that are on TV make it seem so fancy and it has to be so difficult, but it certainly doesn't, you know, learning some very basic concepts of how to roast foods, roasted vegetables are one of the best way to get your kids to eat vegetables. Roasted meats are so easy. You can prepare one dish meals by learning a simple food concept, which is roasting. Learn the difference between steaming and boiling learn how to saute, learn how to stir fry. You can YouTube any of that information and it's basically free and at your fingertips. Um, I really like to use color to guide a meal. The more colorful your meal in terms of the different variety of foods that you're having, the more nutrients that you're gonna have. So you think of all your vitamin A's are gonna be orange, yellow, red, dark greens. Um, All of your vitamin K's are gonna be dark greens. And when in doubt, use a green vegetable to make your meal more colorful. I like to think of your plate and make half of that plate vegetables that are not starchy. So salads, asparagus, um, broccoli, cauliflower, mushrooms. A quarter of the plate can be a lean protein and it can be a plant-based protein or an animal-based protein. So beans, quinoa, fish, even lean beef, lean pork, lean chicken, and then a quarter of the protein can be a starchy vegetable or a grain. This time of the year, um, fall squash are in season. Choosing seasonally based produce is a great way to save money on that. Fall squash like spaghetti squash, acorn squash, um, butternut squash are in season. They're starchy, but they're vitamin and mineral packed. So those starchy vegetables or a grain, a whole grain like brown rice would go on the other quarter of your plate. If you don't want to eat a grain, you can also use a fruit in place of that. Apples and pears are in season right now. We're coming up to December when citrus comes in season. So just familiarizing yourself with what's in season when and some very basic um, cooking terms and just remember that it doesn't have to be difficult. Keeping your kitchen clean and uncluttered is a very easy way to help keep yourself organized. When you find a recipe, make sure that it's simple enough that you can prepare and that you have all the ingredients on hand that you need to cook. Also plan your meals with leftovers in mind. That goes right back to that thing of cook once, eat twice. Thank you. So I'm going to come to up to the last question. If I want to learn more about healthy, inexpensive cooking, where should I go? Well, of course, there are lots and lots of different resources available. Um, Huntington's Kitchen is in partnership with Marshall University Department of Dietetics. We have lots of virtual cooking classes online. We have a chef who cooks for us. The Marshall University Nutrition Education Program has had to pivot to be virtual. So we have many, many options available. We just did a whole Thanksgiving dinner food safety series last night. The WVU Extension Service Family Nutrition Program has um, virtual classes too. And then Miranda's gonna talk about what Keys has to offer. Yeah, so this is our Keys Facebook page. And we post a lot of information about healthy recipes, healthy options, um, information about physical activity. So, and then Keith has some programs that we're currently doing. One of the programs is we're offering cooking classes through our provider practices um, that they, we have a chef that actually teaches families how to cook. So they come and they come to a catering place and we use their, we borrow their kitchen and are able to teach the children how to cook. So that's been really exciting is enabling them with those cooking skills and then they can go home and make the meals um, that they learned how to cook. Another thing we're doing with providers is doing a 5210 prescription program where we have quarterly themes and we've been like in the summer, we did the produce boxes. Right now we're doing physical activity where we give them physical activity incentives to encourage them to be more active. So these are all through our providers. Um, We have another program, the virtual program I talked about, Steps for Stronger Families, that is virtual. It also you're referred from your, or um, at the provider's office, they refer you to this program and we give nutrition education and we have a physical activity portion on that program as well. So um, those are all things that we do that are resources that are helpful and you can find information about those on our Keys for Healthy Kids website, Facebook page. Great, thank you. All right, last time to Maddie. Maddie, do we have any questions or comments? Um, No questions or comments to report. Thank you, Maddie. <laughs> well, that must mean we covered everything. Yeah, <laughs> <see you. No. laughs>
Uh, so that is actually we did rather well. We're right at the top of the hour. So um, that's all the time we have. I'd like to thank Marinda and Amy and Maddie for your time and expertise this evening. So much information um, that I'm glad that we have recorded it and that we'll be able to share it. Um, thanks for all who joined us online. If you have any questions about obesity and hunger or about keys uh, for healthy kids or the Department of Dietetics at Marshall University, just message us on the Think Kids Facebook page and we'll get you connected. Um, Dr. Gannon's department will be working with Think Kids on a video her students are creating that will guide us step by step in creating a healthy meal using inexpensive, readily available ingredients that even a novice chef like myself can follow. So we are looking forward to that in the weeks to come. Um, and so with that, unless you two have any parting words, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Sure, thank you. Appreciate it. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.